Number the Stars by Louis Lowry. Essential question. How did the courageous acts of people in the past affect history? With Nazi soldiers occupying Copenhagen, Denmark in 1943, Anne-Marie Johansson travels with her mother and younger sister Kirsty to her uncle Henrik's house on the Danish coast. Uncle Henrik and Peter Nason, the fiancé of Anne-Marie's older sister, are helping Danish Jews escape in Henrik's boat to safety in Sudan. Among them is the family of Ellen Rosen, Anne-Marie's best friend. After helping escort a group of escapees to the harbor, Anne-Marie's mother trips on the way home and breaks her ankle. In the house, she discovers that an unimportant packet was not delivered, and in alarm, Mrs. Johnson directs Anne-Marie to place the packet at the bottom of a lunch basket and is carried to the harbor before Uncle Henrik departs. On the way, Nazi soldiers stop Anne-Marie and they roughly search the contents of the basket. Anne-Marie gave an exasperated sign. Could I go now, please? She asked impatiently. The soldier reached for the apple. He noted its brown spots and made a face of disgust. No meat? he asked, glancing at the basket and the napkin that lay in its bottom. Anne-Marie gave him a withering look. You know we have no meat, she said insolently. Your army eats all of the Mark's meat. Please, please, she implored in her mind. Don't lift the napkin. The soldier left. He dropped the bruised apple on the ground. One of the dogs leaned forward, pulling at his leash, sniffed the apple and stepped back. But both dogs are still looking intentionally at the basket. Their ears alert, their mouths open, saliva glistening on their smooth pink gums. My dogs smell meat, the soldier said. They smell squirrels in the woods, and Marie responded. You should take them hunting. The soldiers reached forward with the cheese in one hand, as if he were going to return it to the basket, but he didn't. Instead, he pulled out the flowered cotton napkin. Analyze the text, figurative language, and Mary gives the soldier a withering look. What is the meaning of this phrase? Find another example of figurative language at the top of page 675 and tell what it means. Anne-Marie froze. Your uncle has a pretty little lunch, the soldier said scornfully, crumpling the napkin around the cheese in his hands. Like a woman, he added with content. Then his eyes looked on the basket. He handed the cheese and napkin to the soldier beside him. What is that? There, in the bottom, he asked in a different, tenser voice. What would Kirsten do? Anne-Marie stamped her foot. Suddenly, to her own surprise, she began to cry. I don't know, she said. Her voice choked. My mother's going to be angry that you stopped me and made me late. And you've completely ruined Uncle Henrik's lunch. So now he'll be mad at me too. The dogs whined and struggled against the leashes noising forward to the basket. One of the other soldiers muttered something in German. The soldier took out the packet. Why was this so carefully hidden? He snapped. Anne-Marie wiped her eyes on the sleeve of her sweater. It wasn't hidden any more than the napkin was. I don't know what it is. That she realized was true. She had no idea what was in the packet. The soldier tore the paper open while below him, 
On the ground, the dogs strained and snarled, pulling against their leashes. Their muscles were visible beneath the sleek, short-haired flesh. He looked inside, then glared at Anne-Marie. Stop crying, you idiot girl, he said harshly. Your stupid mother has sent your uncle a handkerchief. In Germany, the women have better things to do. They don't stay at home hemming handkerchiefs for their men. He gestured with the folded white cloth and gave a short, caustic laugh. At least she didn't stitch flowers on it. He flung it to the ground, still half wrapped in the paper. Beside the apple, the dogs launched, sniffed at it eagerly, then subsided, disappointed again. Go on, the soldier said. He dropped the cheese and the napkin back into her basket. Go on to your uncle and tell him the German dogs enjoyed his bread. All of the soldiers pushed past her. One of them laughed and they spoke to each other in their own language. In a moment they had disappeared down the path, in the direction from which Anne-Marie had just come. Quickly she picked up the apple and the open packed with the white handkerchief inside. She put them into the basket and ran around the bend toward the harbor where the morning sky was now bright with early sun and some of the boat engines were starting their strident din. The Ingerberg was still there by the clock and Uncle Henrik was there. He slid her wind blow and bright as he knelt by the net. Anne-Marie called to him and he came to the side. His face worried when he recognized her on the dock. She handed the basket across. Mama sent you lunch, she said, her voice quavering. But soldiers stopped me and they took your bread. She didn't dare to tell him more. Henry glanced quickly into the basket. She could see the look of relief on his face and knew that it was because he saw that the packet was there, even though it was torn open. Thank you, he said, and the relief was evident on his voice. Anne-Marie looked quickly around the familiar small boat. She could see down the passageway into the empty cabin. There was no sign of the Rosens or the others. Uncle Herring followed her eyes and her puzzled look. All is well, he said softly. Don't worry, everything is all right. I wasn't sure, he said, but now he hided the basket in his hands. Because of you and Marie, everything is all right. You run home now and tell your mama not to worry. I will see you this evening. He grinned at her suddenly. They took my bread, huh? He said. I hope they choke on it. Poor Blossom, Uncle Herrick said, laughing after dinner that evening. It was bad enough that your mother was going to milk her. After all these years of city life, but in Marie, to do it for the very first time, I'm surprised Blossom didn't kick you. Analyze the text. Understanding characters. How does Anne Marie react to being stopped and questioned by the German soldiers? How does her behavior change from the beginning of the encounter with the soldiers? to the end of it. What does Anne-Marie's attitude with the soldiers tell you about her character? Mama left too. She sat in a comfortable chair that Uncle Henrik had moved from the living room and placed in a corner of the kitchen, her leg in a clean white cast to the knee, 
was on the footstool. Anne-Marie didn't mind their laughing. It had been funny. When she had a ride back at the farmhouse, she had a run along the road to avoid the soldiers, who might still be in the woods. Now, carrying nothing, she was in no danger. Mama and Kirsty were gone. There was a note, hastily written, from Mama, that the doctor was taking her in his car to the local hospital, that they would be back soon. But the noise from Blossom, forgotten, unmilked, uncomfortable, in the barn, had sent Anne-Marie wearily out with the milking bucket. She had done her best, trying to ignore Blossom's irritated snorts and tossing head. Remembering how Uncle Herring's hands had worked with a firm, rhythmic pulling motion, and she had milk. I could have done it, Kirsty announced. You only have to pull and it skirts out. I could do it easily. Anna Marie rolled her eyes. I'd like to see you try, she thought. Is Ellen coming back? Kirsty asked, forgetting the cow after a moment. She said she'd make a dress for my doll. Anna Marie and I you help you make a dress, Mama told her. Ellen had to go with her parents. Wasn't that a nice surprise that the Rosens came last night to get her? She should have walked me up to say goodbye. Kirsty grumbled, spooning some imaginary food into the painted mouth of the doll she had propped in the chair beside her. And Marie, Uncle Henrik said, getting up from the table and pushing back his chair. If you come with me now to the barn, I will give you a milking lesson. Wash your hands first. Me too, said Kirsty. Not to you too, Mama said. Not this time. I need your help here. Since I can't walk very well, you have to be my nurse. Kirsty hesitated, deciding whether to argue. Then she said, I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up, not a cow milker, so I have to stay here and take care of Mama. Followed as usual by the kitten, Anne Marie walked with Uncle Henrik to the barn through a fine misty rain that had begun to fall. It seemed to her that Blossom shook her head happily when she saw Henrik and knew that she would be in good hands again. She sat on the stacked hay and watched while he milked, but her mind was not on the milking. Uncle Harry, she asked, where are the Rosens and the others? I thought you were taking them to Sweden on your boat, but they weren't there. They were there, he told her, leaning forward against the cow's broadside. You shouldn't know this. You remember that I told you it was safer not to know? But he went on as his hands moved with their sure and practiced motion. I will tell you just a little because you were so very brave. Brave? Anna Marie asked, surprised. No, I wasn't. I was very frightened. You risked your life, but I didn't even think about that. I was only thinking of... He interrupted her, smiling. That's all that brave means, not think about the dangers. Just thinking about what you must do. Of course you were frightened. I was too today, but you kept your mind on what you had to do. So did I. Now let me tell you about the Rosens. Many of the fishermen have built hidden places in their boats. I have two. Down underneath, I have only to lift the boards in the right place. And there is a room to hide a few people. Peter and others in the resistance who work with him bring them to me and to the other fishermen. 
as well. There are people who hide them and help them along the way to Gilejlesh. Anne-Marie was startled. Peter is in the resistance? Of course, I should have known. He brings Mama and Papa the secret newspaper, Die Friedansky. And he always seems to be on the move. I should have figured it out myself. He is a very, very brave young man. Uncle Henrik said they all are. Anne Marie frowned, remembering the empty boat that morning. Were the Rosens and the others there? Then underneath, when I brought the basket? Uncle Henrik nodded. I heard nothing, Anne Marie said. Of course not. They had to be absolutely quiet for many hours. The baby was drugged so that it wouldn't wake and cry. Could they hear me when I talked to you? Yes, your friend Ellen told me later that they heard you and they heard the soldiers who came to search the boat. Anne-Marie's eyes widened. Soldiers came? She asked. I thought they went the other way after they stopped me. They are many soldiers in Gilelege and all along the coast. They are searching all the boats now. They know that the Jews are escaping, but they are not sure how, and they rarely find them. The hiding places are carefully concealed, and often we pile dead fish on the deck as well. They hate getting their shining boots dirty. He turned his head toward her and grinned. Anne Marie remembered the shining boots confronting her on the dark path. Uncle Henry, she said, I'm sure you are right that I shouldn't know everything, but please, would you tell me about the handkerchief? I knew it was important, the packet, and that's why I ran through the woods to take it to you. But I thought maybe there was a map. How could a handkerchief be important? He set the field pain aside and began to wash the cow's udder with the damp cloth. Very few people know about this enemy, he said with a serious look. But the soldiers are so angry about the escaping Jews and the fact that they can't find them that they have just started using trained dogs. They had dogs, the ones who stopped me on the path. Uncle Herring nodded. The dogs are trained to sniff about and find where people are hidden. It happened just yesterday on two boats. Those dogs, they go right through dead fish to the human scent. We were all very, very worried. We thought it meant the end of the escape to Sweden by boat. It was Peter who took the problem to scientists and doctors. Some very fine minds have worked night and day trying to find a solution. And they have created a special drug. I don't know what it is, but it was in the hand curve shift. It attracts the dogs, but when they sniff at it, it ruins their sense of smell. Imagine that! Anne-Marie remembered how the dogs had lunged at the handkerchief, smelled it, and then turned away. Now, thanks to Peter, we will each have such a handkerchief, each boat captain. When the soldiers board our boats, we will simply pull the handkerchiefs out of our pockets. The Germans will probably think we all have bad coats. The dogs we will sniff about, sniff the handkerchiefs we are holding and then run the boat and find nothing. They will smell nothing. Did they bring dogs to your boat this morning? Yes. Not 20 minutes after you had gone. I was about to pull away from the dock when the soldiers appeared and ordered me to halt. They came aboard, searched found nothing. But then, of course, I had the handkerchief. If I had not, well, 
His voice trailed off and he didn't finish the sentence. He didn't need to. If she had not found the packet where Mr. Rosen had dropped it, if she had not run through the woods, if the soldiers had taken the basket, if she had not reached the boat in time, all of the ifs whirled in the Anne Marie's head. They are saving the Sweden now? she asked. You're sure? Uncle Herring stood and patted the cow's head. I saw them ashore. There were people waiting to take them to shelter. They are quite safe there. But what if the Nazis invade Sweden? Will the Rosens have to run away again? That won't happen. For reasons of their own, the Nazis want Sweden to remain free. It is very complicated. Anne Marie's thoughts turned to her friends, hiding under the deck of the Ingerberg. It must have been awful for them, so many hours there, she murmured. Was it dark in the hiding place? Dark and cold and very cramped, and Mrs. Rosen was seasick, even though we were not on the water very long. It is a short distance, as you know, but they are courageous people, and none of that matter when they stepped ashore. The air was fresh and cool and sudden. The wind was blowing. The baby was beginning to wake as I said goodbye to them. I wonder if I will ever see Ellen again, Anna Marie said sadly. You will, little one. You saved her life after all. Someday you will find her again. Someday her, the war will end, Uncle Henry said. All wars do. Now then, he added, stretching. That was a quite a milking lesson, was it not? Analyze the text. Cause and effect. What would have happened if Anna Marie had not delivered the handkerchief to Uncle Harry in time? For further reading, numerous well-known books, both historical fiction and non-fiction, have been written about the time period that is depicted by Lois Lowry and Number the Stars. One of the most celebrated and classic books from this era is Annie Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl, the actual diary of a Dutch Jewish girl who, upon receiving a blank red and white checkered diary for her 30th birthday, recorded in profound detail her own experiences while in hiding with her family for 25 months in Nazi occupied Amsterdam. Annie Frank initially wrote the diary entries for herself, filling up the original volume and multiple other notebooks with her memoir. However, after hearing a plea on a Dutch radio broadcast for eyewitness accounts of the war, including letters and diaries, Annie decided that after the war, she would publish her diary as a book. Because Annie Frank did not survive World War II, her father, Otto Frank, assumed the responsibility for seeing that the diary entries would be published and shared with a large audience. The diary was not accepted for publication immediately. Many publishers rejected the manuscript before it was first printed in Holland in 1947 and later in the United States in 1952. The rest is history. The famous diary has been translated into more than 70 different languages and has become one of the world's most widely read works of literature. In 1955, a play based on Anne Frank's chronicle won the Pulitzer Prize and a motion picture soon followed. Anne Frank's diaries and entries were not the only pieces of prose she produced while hiding in a labyrinth of rooms above her father's office. 
She also penned several short stories and collected her favorite quotes, an idea that her father gave her. In portions of her diary, Anne Frank reflects on her favorite quotes and references her story writing too. To read more about Anne Frank and her family's harrowing experiences during World War II, look for the famous diary during your next visit to the library or research her history on the internet. Many websites and museums around the world are dedicated to educating people about the life of Anne Frank and the historical context for her memorable diary.